Yes. We've talked up to this point in our discussion in rather negative terms. We've talked about what the Frankfurt School was against. We've talked about its critique of Marxism and at least by implication its, its critique of the capitalist system. Uh, what was its positive contribution? Well, I would say to start with the easiest one, uh, one of uh, its decisive uh, positive contributions was a prediction of fascism uh, long before it actually happened. Uh, secondly, uh, what uh, Horkheimer himself considered as a distinguishing characteristic, the interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, to the great social and uh, political problems of uh, the time. Uh, cutting across the academic division of labor, applying sociology, psychology, philosophy to the uh, understanding and developing of uh, the uh, problems of the uh, time. And in my view, uh, the most interesting contribution, the uh, attempt to answer the question, what actually has gone wrong in Western civilization that at the very height of a technical progress, we see at the same time uh, the opposite as far as human progress is concerned. Dehumanization, brutalization, uh, the torture again as normal means of interrogation, uh, the uh, wasteful development of nuclear energy, destructiveness everywhere and so on. How has this happened? And uh, he, especially Horkheimer, but also the others, went back into uh, not only a social but also intellectual history and tried uh, to uh, define the interplay between progressive and repressive categories throughout the intellectual history of the West, especially in the Enlightenment, for example, which is usually considered as one of the most progressive uh, phases in history, and uh, the uh, Frankfurt School pointed out to what extent this uh, apparently uh, perfectly clear progressiveness, this liberating tendency was at the same time tied up with regressive and repressive tendencies. This uh, uh, picture that you paint of a group of Marxists um, almost obsessed with the question, what has gone wrong, suggests to me uh, uh, politics of disillusionment. I mean, there seems to be an aura about it of disappointed hopes, disappointment with a Marxist theory, disappointment perhaps even with the working class itself for failing to be an effective instrument of revolution. Was there something disappointed or disillusioned or pessimistic at the center of your approach in those days? Well, if a disappointment means, as you formulated, disappointment with the working class, I would decidedly reject it. Uh, none of us has a right uh, to blame the working class for what it is doing or what it is not doing. So this kind of uh, disappointment, certainly not. Uh, there was indeed another disappointment, and that seems to me a very objective uh, attitude. Uh, I mentioned it before, namely that uh, the uh, incredible social wealth that had been assembled in Western civilization and mainly as the achievement of capitalism was increasingly used for destroying rather than constructing a, a more decent and humane society. If you call that disappointment, yes, but I think it's a very uh, justified and objective and you And you saw your central task as being an investigation of the reasons as to why that was exactly. so. Exactly. How had it come about? So the essential uh, um, enterprise of the Frankfurt School was a critical one. Definitely. Yes. So therefore, the term critical theory today yes. for uh, the uh, writings of the Frankfurt yes. School. One thing that the members of the Frankfurt School uh, exhibited very considerable concern with from the beginning was aesthetics. And this, I think, differentiates it from most other philosophies, certainly from most other political philosophies. And you yourself have written a lot in recent years about aesthetic matters. Why did you and your colleagues always regard aesthetics as so important? Well, I believe, and it was Adorno who is, uh, to whom I'm closest in this respect, I believe that in art, literature, and music, uh, insights and truth are uh, expressed, which cannot be 
communicated in ordinary language, uh, let's say in prose uh, for brevity's uh, sake, and that with these truths, uh, images, the image of an entirely new dimension is opened, uh, which is either repressed or tabooed in uh, reality. Namely, uh, the image of a uh, human existence and of nature no longer confined within the norms of a repressive reality principle, but uh, really uh, striving for their fulfillment and uh, gratification, even at the price of death and uh, catastrophe. I try to uh, illustrate it by uh, saying that uh, the match, uh, well, uh, let me use a terrible word, the message of art and literature is uh, that actually the world should be experienced uh, so as the lovers of all times experienced it, as uh, King Lear experienced it, as Anthony and Cleopatra experienced it. In other words, a rupture with the established reality principle at the same time, the invocation of the images of liberation. In other words, what you're saying now ties up with what you were saying very near the beginning of our discussion about uh, your insistence that socialism should be dis concerned with a different quality of life exactly. and not only with material exactly. matters. And that means that you, at least, see uh, literature as a repository of new values and you don't just see it as a... As a, as a a critique of existing society or a revolutionary instrument in the way that many Marxist uh, critics, literary critics I would do. say it is all authentic literature is both. It is on the one hand accusation of the existing society, uh, but on the other hand and internally linked to it, always the images of uh, liberation. Mm -hmm. I certainly do not believe that you can give any adequate explanation of a literary work simply in terms of the class struggle or whatever it may be. Well, this is a field in which uh, thinkers in the tradition of the Frankfurt School, like yourself, are now doing fresh and original work. What other areas do you think the, uh, this school of philosophy, this tradition of philosophy, is going to have to concern itself with in the immediate future? Well, I can in this respect only talk of myself. And I would say that uh, far more attention should be paid to the women's liberation movement. I see in the women's liberation movement today a, a very strong radical uh, potential. Now, I would have to give a lecture in order to explain do why I do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I, I cannot. Yeah. Uh, let me at least try to say it in uh, two uh, sentences. Uh, all domination in recorded history up to today was patriarchal domination. So if uh, we should indeed live to see not only a, a equality of uh, the woman before the law, whatever it is, but uh, the uh, deployment of uh, what is called the specific feminine quality throughout the society, for example, nonviolence, receptivity, tenderness, this would indeed be, or perhaps could be, the beginning of a qualitatively different society, the very antithesis to uh, male domination uh, with its violent and brutal character. Now, I'm uh, myself perfectly uh, conscious of the fact that these so-called specific feminine qualities are socially conditioned. I was and, going to say, uh, there are people who would regard it as sexist to say that all they right. are now, specifically uh, they feminine. Are, uh, I don't qualities. care. They are socially yes. conditioned, but to a great extent they are available. They are there. So yeah. why not use them the way they are, yeah. regardless of the question as to their origin? 